of all the places, of all the sermons to be delivered today across the land, is there anything as devastating as Isaiah chapter 15? I don't know of many chapters. We have certainly of the, even some of the minor prophets who have similar words to say about Moab and the disaster that is to come upon this country, this nation. Just to put a few things into perspective for you in this 15th chapter, and then we'll get straightway to the exhortation of the text and ultimately uh, the application that will come as a result of spending time reading about this chapter, about the people, and then desiring to make application to us today, in this modern day, from the oracle or the burden of Moab, concerning Moab. Well, first of all, who, we have to ask ourselves, who even are these people? We, we, have, we, we can see from all, all of the history of the Israelites, they've been, they've been pestered by a people called the Moabites. And there's one of the nations that, are, that, that uh, actually begins essentially at the same time when Abraham and Lot are dividing up the land between the two families. These of essentially from the same bloodline of the family, from uh, extended natures of the family. You have Lot and Abraham who are traveling together into the land and Abraham, led by the Spirit of God, gives Lot the choice of the land to choose. And he chooses a place uh, that, is, that, that has the inhabited cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in it. And in the day in which Lot makes this choice, uh, one would find the place lush, full of green, water everywhere, fresh water, wells for the livestock, uh, affluent in, its, in the prosperity of the produce of the land, uh, able to produce multiple beyond the, the land's necessary inhabitants. So the, the ability to give widespread trade of the produce of the land of Moab. To put into perspective a few other things that might be helpful for us, especially when we bring consideration of the kind of devastation that is spoken of, of this land. This is a country essentially the size of the Magic Valley. So just to kind of put a, a few things into perspective, a block of land about 60 miles by 40 miles, if we were to break it down into modern day distances, it would be as, as, as far south as the Idaho-Nevada border to um, this would be a bit further in total distance, but we could include Jerome. And you could be as far away as Wendell or Hagerman in that valley and come as far as, as, um, as perhaps Burley and, and Rupert and Paul, including that kind of a block of, of landscape. Now, I don't know what you know about the Magic Valley, but they tell us that of all of the, the places in the United States, this actually is among one of the most fertile places that if we, we don't pray for this we don't hope for this but if things were to, to fall apart altogether of the United States that there is enough the only thing we don't have here is abundance in oil supply but everything else we have and we have abundance of it and that because of water the life the water that brings life to the desert floor and when you bring water to this land, it grows produce. This is Moab. Today, if you were to take a satellite look at this, I would encourage perhaps a teaching moment in your homes, gather around the, the internet machine at your home in a safe place where it's in public, which is always the best place for that That. I don't know why somewhere along the way I picked up calling it the internet machine. It's really not a machine, is it? It's just a thing. Uh, but glance at that thing. Get a, get a Google map view and find the ancient land of Moab. It'll be around the, the, the general area of the Middle East. But look at it today and you'll find it largely a brown desert. Where what looks to be where rivers once fl flowed in abundance are mostly dried up, barren 
it, it, is, it is a quite different place. You would be able to see, if you were to do some research, and I would highly recommend that. As a, I wouldn't have the time to break down every city that is mentioned here in chapter 15, but there are 16 real places mentioned in these nine verses. Now that alone ought to excite you about the fact that you're reading something that can be archaeologically understood and studied. Nearly every one of these 16 cities or, or places have been archaeologically found and discovered. Even ancient uh, stone chiseled out events and things that were happening in this day of Isaiah chapter 15 that would speak of the kind of disaster and destruction and ruin that was coming upon the land. So it, gives, it ought to give the reader confidence. So you're not reading a fictitious story. Even though in my bad pronunciation of some of these names, you might think you're reading the Lord of the Rings and some of the names of these places. That fictitious book is fiction. It is, you can't go to an archaeological dig and find any city in any fictitious story. But you can in real stories made up with real people. Isaiah 15 may be one of the most densely packed, archaeologically solid places you can go to in Scripture and say, this is about real people in real cities, and this is a real thing that's happening. Go with confidence. And now, even though the word of Isaiah 15 is no good news, it is yet at the same, it is no less confidence building in our lives. The evidence of it lays there. So Moab, a, a nation about the size of the Magic Valley, its, its, its existence is largely that of a pestering, picking off of a scab of every nation around them. That's the kind of... They're a, they're a people of war as well as an agricultural people who have a self-sustaining land which gives them the length of time in which they, they exist in the days of the Bible, the ancient days. So we can see from as early as Genesis chapter 19, we see it here in Isaiah 15. You can go back and read uh, of Moab from Deuteronomy chapter 2, from Numbers chapter 22. You would hear and you would read about uh, encounters of the people of Moab as well as the plethora of other places where the, this nation continues to give uh, hardship upon God's people, known as the nation of Israel. Perhaps what gets missed a lot of times the most, and we're just trying to give, give a bedrock foundation here about this nation, but let's get, the, let's get to the real core of this people. This is, this is essentially a nation from the house of Lot. Now again, remembering that Lot sets up his tent uh, in his desire to do so, he, in his choice of where he's going to build himself and plant himself and his family, they, he, the scripture describes him as planting his tent toward Sodom uh, because of the attraction that the city was in its day. So it, it stands for us as a picture of a danger of putting sinfulness as the front window the front picture window of our homes that we would be able to peer at and to gaze at her beauty. When in all reality, behind the scenes, in a place like Sodom and Gomorrah, is an uprising of pride and arrogance of a people who hate God. And Lot found that city. He found that those twin cities an attraction. Eventually, we know that Lot and his family even go and they live in the city of Sodom and they dwell there for a season. And you remember that time where the, the angel of the Lord comes to Abraham and he's about to go and destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham pleads with him to not go and do so. And eventually it comes down to this. There's none righteous in the city except for Lot. And that's not saying righteous that, that Lot was a uh, upright standing man because we're about to hear something or, or for the most part maybe you're going to hear for the first time something about lot either that you've forgotten or that you'd like to forget you know when that 
the messengers, the angels of God come and they tell, they warn Lot that he must flee the city. Because God can't destroy the city until they're out of the city. And so Lot gathers his wife and his daughters and they eventually do leave the city. And you, you know that while they're going, that the angels of the Lord even warn Lot not to look back on the city. And Lot's wife, perhaps it's because of her affection for the beauty of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the strength that she presented, the facade that she was. And she turns and looks and the Bible describes that she is immediately turned into dust or salt waste salt Lot and his daughters continue to go and eventually they go and they seek refuge in a cave in a place called Zoar now I know I read and poorly pronounced 16 different places in chapter 15 but one of those was Zoar in this in this cave a grave sin happened there as Lot's daughters are worried about how will our family be able to continue on. There's no one around us. We, the only place we've been able to seek refuge here is in Zoar, in the, is in this cave. We won't be able to have children of our own. We won't be able to, to, to extend the family of our heritage. And so they, along with the sin of Lot, they devise a wicked plan and they engage in incestuous relationships, daughter and father, voluntarily, and never, there's no evidence that they ever repent of it. As a matter of fact, all of the evidence from this shows that their arrogance in that decision just increased arrogance even further. So the nation of Moab has its beginnings in a cave of Zoar, built out of a sinful relationship between father and daughters and never address the sin before God. And sin upon sin upon sin upon sin upon sin continues to infest the city for generations, the family, for generation after generation after generation. And no one stops to deal with the real sin. The Bible forbids that kind of activity. And in that case, we, can, we, we, we have no reason to believe that Lot didn't know this. Uh, Lot, there, there, matter of fact, I think we can build a strong biblical case that Lot knew this activity was inappropriate and a sin against God. And so you have a nation whose beginnings from a cave in Zoar, fleeing the destructive city of Sodom and Gomorrah, essentially seek to rebuild all of the sinful activity that God destroyed as they left the city. That is the judgment. That is the oracle. That is the burden concerning Moab. In that first verse, now keep in mind, this is, this is a nation that has developed themselves uh, scientifically, agriculturally, and militarily. They are a strong people as far as nations go. They are, they are an intelligent people as far as agriculture goes. They have learned and discovered great things along the way, but yet never dealing with the sin that they've committed. And so, in that first verse, we see that this mighty nation of Moab, two of its fortified, most fortified cities are destroyed in one night. Now, the Bible, Isaiah does not describe to us at all any of the details of how they were destroyed. Likely, they are destroyed in the similar way in which they went and destroyed other nations because of what will follow from verse 2 and following, the, the kinds of descriptions of the disaster and the wailing and the crying and the weeping, the, the shaving of heads and the pulling of beards, the wearing of sackcloth. It is likely that these two cities are destroyed in one night 
in the very similar way in which they de devastated nations or cities in their wake. So in that first verse, we read of these two significant cities that are destroyed and devastated. They're ruined. They're laid waste. Their response, rather than... One, one, would, one would stop to think, under that kind of severity, one would have to begin to, to think, what, what do we do now? And their response is to go to the temple. Now, be certain of this, that Isaiah's description here of the temple is not Jerusalem. It's not the temple of, of Jehovah. This is not the temple of Almighty God. They go to the temple at Dibdin. This is a pagan temple. And they go there, as he describes it, even to the high places, the shrines that they've built on the mountainsides and out in the byways of, of, of the nation. They go there to present their gifts to this dead, mute, unable to do anything God that they have created for themselves. And there they go to these places to weep. The scripture says and describes it in this way that as they've gone to the temple in, their, in, these, in these high places to weep, that Moab wails over two other locations, Nebo and Medaba, two, two places again that would have been high-ranking places in their worship of these pagan gods that they've adopted and that they've cried out and, and given all, all, uh, all credibility in their descriptions to their strength militarily and to their agricultural strength. They've gone there weeping, presenting their gifts, bringing their baskets full of food for their rock god or their wood gods to eat, to sacrifice to them. They go there wailing and weeping. The description before, chapter, before verse 2 is finished is that everyone's head is bald and every beard is cut off. Those are descriptions of the cultural kind of ways in which one would respond to this kind of devastation. That would be like, well, you've, you've seen Jasper, haven't you? Our little Jasper here. That would be like that boy getting his head shaved. Everyone in here would be shocked. Of, Why would you ever do that to that kind of a head of hair? Well, you would only do that if you're in this kind of disaster. It'd be like going to Greg Mooring and seeing him clean shaven. <laughs> now the likelihoods of that are probably next to nothing. But if you're in this kind of disaster, this state of ruin, and your only hope is a dumb, mute, lifeless God, then that's what you do. You shave your heads and you pluck out your beards because you think that your worthless God might see your sincere behavior before them. Oh, foolish Moabites. They should have turned to Jehovah Almighty. Verse 3, it's in their streets. So keep in mind this nation about the size of the Magic Valley. Two of the most fortified, two of the most economically central or, or, or strategically necessary cities have already been laid waste. And so any survivor out of the, the two twin cities of, of, of Ar and Kir laid waste, nobody can, sustain, can be sustained there any longer. They go to the neighboring cities and there everyone is wailing because those two cities, all of the economy depended upon what was happening in those two cities. And so not only because those two cities are laid waste, their places of worship have been laid waste as well. So everyone is walking, wailing, crying, walking in sackcloth. They're on their housetops and they're in the public square and everyone, the last line of verse 3, is wailing. The description is so graphic that they're dissolved in their tears. Now perhaps in the historic pictures and videos of recent years, recent I would include since the advent of the ability to have video footage of cities that have been laid waste, either by natural disaster or by military advance. 
And you see some of the most amazingly sorrowful photographs and videos of cities that have been laid waste. Nowhere can you find anything edible in the city. One might think of any of the images or videos that came out of the end of World War II and the dropping of the only atomic bombs on civilized places. You look at that laid waste. Anyone who's living in that is in a state of great disaster and ruin. There is no one smiling in this day. Where do we pick up the pieces now? Where do we go now? We can't stay here. The radiation has ruined everything. Now, they didn't have this radiation in this. But the, the kind of devastation is of equal severity. Well, verse 4 just speaks more of this. Two more places where that within this nation of Moab, what would be really essentially a, 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 a pretty insignificant as far as landscape goes, but notice all of these cities, these places, they're crying out. Their, ver their voices in this city are heard all the way to Jahaz. So these two cities crying out together at the stillness of the night, the wailing in those cities is so severe that this neighboring city can hear ever so faintly perhaps, but they can hear the wailing of the inhabitants, the mourning, the howling even, if you will. The soul is at such a devastated position that before the, the fourth verse is finished, it even addresses the military is so devastated that the, the armed men, the soldiers, are crying out. Now it is no good day when a nation's military's only reported action is wailing and crying. There is no parade in the streets of Moab in this day. No soldier coming home to be paraded as a hero of foreign wars. No, even the armed men of Moab are crying out. Their soul trembles within themselves. Well, verse 5, we have a snapshot here of the heart of the evangelist Isaiah. Now I think we can build a strong case that this could be Isaiah's personal experiences or his personal response to this. And we could build a strong case that this could be God that's being spoken of here in verse 5 where he says, My heart cries out for Moab. I think both are true. I don't think that we're, 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 we're out of bounds to say in either place that Isaiah as he's prophesying, giving this oracle, the burden of Moab, it's not been wasted yet, it's not been destroyed yet, but here, Isaiah knows this is the oracle of God given to this nation, and it would not be far, for, far from us to see from what we've learned about Isaiah that his heart is crying out for the inhabitants of Moab. We also know that because of the, the benefit that we have of the prophets of of, of God and the descriptions of God giving to man that God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. So either way, whether it's interpreted as Isaiah's heart cries out for Moab or if it's God's heart, it is one and the same. There is sorrow for the inhabitants of Moab. As soon as that statement is made, the word goes right back to more of the hardships, the fugitives now. So everyone's on the run. Any, anyone still living after all of the cities that have been laid waste up to this point are considered fugitives. They're on the run. They're refugees looking for a homeland. And his fugitives are as far as Zoar. There it is where... Lot sins with his daughters here in the, in, in the nation of Moab. And Eglath, now if, if you're using the King James, it doesn't use this, this, this descriptive word. It just describes the word as a three-year-old heifer. Um, this would be 
you know, you, you, you live in dairy land or a land that has a lot of dairies. Um, this, this Eglath place is described in some translations as just the three-year-old heifer. It's a way of describing the agricultural benefit of this location. Uh, as to as the translator's prerogative as to whether they put the description in or the name of the place. You might know it as the dairy as you're heading out north of this place or heading west of, from this place. It might have a name to the regular inhabitants, but it might just be known as the place where the three-year-old heifers are. Well, so, so we know that, e that even from the cave to the cattle yard, what is, what is going on here? They go up to the ascent of Lueth weeping. So from the inhabited cities to the countryside regions, there is widespread from border to border weeping of the nation. Surely on the road he speaks further. Even along the way there, rises a, there raises a cry of distress over their ruin. And then he begins to speak of their lifeline, the waters. This, this river and that river, the waters of Nimrim, are desolate. This is how severe this disaster is. Surely the grass even is withered and the tender grass is dried up. You get that visual anywhere you drive within the next day or two that looks green because of spring rains will be, will be desert brown unless it has an irrigation pipe laid out on it that keeps it green. This is the kind of landscape that is otherwise lush and productive is now laid, dried up. And there is, by description of Isaiah, the prophetic word about this place, Moab, there is no green thing. Therefore, the abundance which now speaks that this small nation of Moab had not only a fortified military, not only had lush agriculture, but they essentially had everything that any one person in any nation could ever want. And that is abundance, which they had acquired. Not only did they acquire abundance, but they, their banks were full, their banks were healthy, they stored up, and they carried off off over the brook of Arbim for the cry of distress. So that which was once abundant is now empty. What once was overflowing from the grain of the harvest from the previous year is now laid waste and it's all gone. And the cry of distress has gone around the territory of Moab. It, its wails go as far as Eglon and wailing even to bear Elium. And then to more of the waters, the lifeblood of the region. Their waters are full of blood. The devastation of the livestock, the devastation of, of, of souls, of people is so severe that it's described as the, as the rivers now being filled with blood. That is a significant devastation. Chapter, but verse 9, the second line, even at that end, all of the hardship is still not yet over. So now Isaiah is speaking of God that He will bring added woes. So if, if the current description of the previous eight verses was not enough to get your attention, then Isaiah comes and says this, there are added woes now. If there was wailing before, there would certainly be howling today. If there was wailing today, there would be, and the descriptions of them being dissolved in their tears, they're, they're completely undone. And then, if there is any survivor, then the lions will devour them. Now this remnant that he describes of in verse 9 is not the remnant of Judah, is not the remnant of God's people. This is the remnant of of the nation of, of Moab, they too, if everything prior to this, if somehow, some way, one is able to escape all of the disaster, be certain of this, that the wild lions, the mountain lions of the region, the, the beast 
in, the, in their area will as well devour anyone who survives. Well, there you have Isaiah 15. I want to take you back to verse 5 because I think here the evangelist is speaking toward the gospel. Everything, think of it for a minute, everything you hold precious and treasured in your life, gone in the blink of an eye. Laid waste, devastated, gone. Would it not bless you to know that the, that the evangelist's heart is filled with compassion for you? Wouldn't it be good to know that the creator of the universe's heart has compassion leaning towards you? Now, the Bible describes a lot of things about this nation of Moab, and never, never do we have, I shouldn't say never, but there is one time where there will be a blessing that will come out of the country of Moab. Every other time which Scripture mentions the nation of Moab, it is that God is unleashing, using the nation to, to discipline God's people, or God bringing this kind of disaster upon them because of the level of wickedness in which they live. This is a nation. So this is speaking of a national sin the nation, has, the nation of Moab has never properly dealt with the sin of Lot and his daughters. And because of that arrogance, they have not once come to God Almighty repenting of their pride and their arrogance. And so this is now a national sin. I hope you understand this when you read the Bible, that God deals with nations and sins of nations. This is no picture that any nation would ever want to see where God, how God deals with a national sin such as this. The other things that we know about Moab, we know already about its beginning in Genesis chapter 19. We know about her ending, or at least the proclamation of her ending, the oracle of her ending here in Isaiah 15. It will come sometime during the reign of Babylon, the, 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 the ravaging uh, army of Babylon will eventually lay waste Moab. That will be, that will be the, the end of Moab. Never again to rise up as a nation. You'll also recall, perhaps if you remember reading in Numbers chapter 22 through 25, there is this man by the name of Balak that hates Israel. He hates God's people so much that he goes out and finds a prophet for hire. Oh, you didn't know there were such things as this, did you? Uh, there still are today, of some level or degree. But he found, went and found a man whom, whose reputation preceded him, that this was a man whom God listened to. Uh, do not think at any level that Balaam was a God-fearing man, but Balaam certainly was, was an individual who was out for hire. And so Balak brings Balaam in and he hires him to, to, to speak a curse against God's people. And, and you know, the, if, you, if you go back and reread the story, it might be good, a good uh, portion of Scripture to reread with the family. Sit down and read how Balaam wrestles with this. He goes and he comes back and he goes and he comes back and he says, yeah, I just can't do this. I can't, I can't speak a cursed word against God's people because you know God says that that he himself will curse those who curse his people. So Balaam, seeking of his own self-interest, just simply says, listen, I'll do a lot of bad things, but that one bad thing I won't do. I'll do a lot of other unspeakable things, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak a curse word against Israel. And finally, there apparently was a price that he was willing to do so. And so he's on his way to speak a cursed word against Israel. And you remember what happens? He has a conversation like you and I have never had with a donkey. And that donkey has more wisdom than Balaam. Because there stands in the road an angel of the Lord blocking the way 
forbidding Balaam to go and to speak a cursed word against Israel. One could even look at that as an act of mercy of that God gave to Balaam to forbid him from going forward with his plans. So we know that this nation of Israel is hated by Moab. The immorality of the nation continues to just, in its heyday, flourishing. Plagues will eventually break out as a result of their immorality. The Moabites spend years attempting to rid themselves of their neighbor Israel. Maybe, well, I should drop that word maybe. I'm going to go ahead and do that in my notes, so forbid, forgive me for just a second. The most famous Moabite of all in the Bible. Do you know her name? Oh, a sweet gal who, she marries a guy from Israel. And that Israelite was forbidden of God to marry Moabites. Matter of fact, it's even specifically said. But again, it speaks of the grace, the mercy. Doesn't, get, doesn't speak about permission. But it speaks of this, where this husband of Ruth dies, and she's with her family, with her mother-in-law. And you remember that precious thing that Ruth says, your God is my God. She makes a proclamation that Yahweh is now her God. Not this lifeless God up on the temple, up at the temple in her homeland in Moab. Not like this God that's worshipped in the high places where people bring their fruit, their fruit and their produce and their riches and drop them at the, at the feet of these lifeless gods. No, Ruth has been captured by the glory of Almighty God. And it is from a Moabite, the stated enemies of God, that finds a way of a, what otherwise might be seen in this day, or perhaps in any culture, a somewhat uh, insignificant individual who shows up in the bloodline of King David. What a blessed grace of God! David's great-grandmother, a Moabite of all people, a scandalous, a scandalous thing perhaps even, but there is the grace, there is the gospel, there is the hope that stands for all nations to see, that a nation, even where this kind of devastation is laid upon them, the heart of God Almighty has compassion for them and He draws out of them one who will stand in the royal bloodline of the one who will eventually come from the tribe of Judah who will come as the Redeemer, as the Messiah of all peoples who will call upon the name of God. Isn't that a kindness of God? A nation that is otherwise everything about her against God. A stated enemy. It's just like you and me. This is what the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes, that we are at enmity before God. We are, we are enemies of God in our unconverted estate. If you do not have faith, in, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've not declared Him as your Savior, then you are as declared an enemy of God Almighty as the nation of Moab. You stand today to face this kind of devastation. Your soul, your very, you, you, that everlasting part of you that God has designed to live forever will face this kind of disaster of Isaiah 15 unless by the grace of God He calls you out of your sworn enemy state of Him and He puts His grace upon you. Here is a great picture. Moab may be no more. Nations, nations, are, nations must face the sins that they commit. Even this nation that has cursed Israel and has have attempted to hire 
other people to curse Israel. They've defamed the name of God. They've littered other nations with their sin. They've exported their sin into other nations. They've exported their foreign gods to other nations. They've taught them to sin. They've advanced their sinful agendas. They're, they've made sin look glamorous. Does it sound like any place you might know of today? It might even be our own homeland that has put sin at such a place that now the advancement, the intentional advancing and making of sin glamorous and going generation after generation of unrepented national sins. Could it be that you're hearing today the compassion of God? Could it be that your, your eyes have landed on the first line of verse 5 for this very reason that you would see in God's mercy that you would see His desire to pour out His grace upon the land? I would say, look out, you promoters of sin. Beware, you educators of more sin. Be careful, family. Be careful what you promote in your households. Be careful what you declare as fun and entertaining. Moab is described in Scripture as a wash pot. Now this is an interesting description that the Old Testament writers give to us. They're speaking of giving these adjectives to the nations around Israel. And Moab is declared a wash pot. Now, a wash pot is not something that's necessarily common for you and I. And this day when you traveled, you traveled on dusty roads. You didn't travel in air-conditioned cars. You, you didn't travel with closed-toed shoes. You traveled in sandals. Maybe you even traveled barefoot. You traveled on livestock. You traveled on roads where livestock were. You traveled on streets where people dumped their, their household waste in. And you'd come to visit somebody there would be a wash pot. There would, be, there would be a basin filled with fresh water, and then there would be a wash pot where you would put your feet. You'd put your feet above this wash pot while the servants of the house would pour the fresh water over your feet. And they would clean, they would, they would get all of that grime and dust, as much stench as they possibly could off of your feet. And everything would drain into the wash pot. This is how the Bible describes the nation of Moab. A wash pot. Now, nobody has any good use for the water in the wash pot. This is the kind of nation, the sin-filled, the, the, the vile activity, unrepented for generations, you would take that water, the best thing to do with it is to be take it out in the street and dump it on the road, only to be washed off by someone else's feet in another wash pot. You would never take that water into the kitchen and find any good use for it. I promise you, you wouldn't. This nation, for all observances, no one could say they did not deserve this kind of devastation. Nor could anyone make a case that a woman named Ruth from this nation known as a wash pot would be in the, the royal line that would eventually enter into all of humanity the Redeemer Jesus is not of the bloodline of Ruth, but through the house of Judah. Jesus, you remember, you know, is born of a virgin. There is no blood of man, the seed of man. The, this work is a supernatural work that God does through the household of David, whose great-grandmother was from a wash pot. Here's... Here's four things I think are noteworthy of application from this. Let's, let's consider them as we prepare to go forth as 
displayers of the grace of God, the mercy of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would say, first of all, you, you, you need to look at your own wash pot. And I don't mean to super spiritualize anything here, but can we use the image for just a moment? That, that picture of Moab being described as a wash pot, I think it's a valid, I think it's a usable, I think it's a helpful picture. What, what if you were to, what if, the, what if the blood of Christ were to wash you clean and all the filth and all of the vileness of your life were to be dripped and drained into a wash pot? Do you see the kind of vileness that's there? Do you, do, are you able? Do you even desire to look at your life? Do you even want to have this vileness washed off of you? Or are you just really pretty happy and content, prideful of all of the sin in which you entangle yourself in, giving no consideration to righteousness or holiness? Are you that calloused? Are you that unaware of the holiness of God? Oh, I would say, ask that Almighty God would give grace to you and wash you clean. Then do not keep that filthy water. <laughs> Don't go bathing in it again. Don't spread it around. Don't share it with your friends. Get rid of it. Another thing I think is worthy of exer observing here and making application. The problem of Moab, <coughs> excuse me, the problem with Moab is really not so much of what happened in that cave with Lot and his daughters. It really began with Lot's desire to plant his tent facing Sodom and Gomorrah. Beloved believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, proclaimer of the grace of Almighty God, what business do you have of setting your tent up facing the sin of our, of our day? What business do you have to give yourself in or to put the temptation constantly in front of you? Eventually, the temptation that you, that you so willingly and eagerly place in front of you will eventually, you will eventually justify as activity worthy of your participation in. Why have you set up camp in the camp of the enemy of God? Why have you set your tent facing that which God is going to destroy and somehow in your mind look at it with attraction? Some of you are in this same wake or you're in the same level of disaster you've set yourself up. You've set yourself up for disaster and you've set your gaze toward the city of sin and you want it. Look closely, it won't be long. You'll be living in that city. Don't, 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 don't be surprised that God will someday do something that will shake you and rattle you and you'll want to flee that city. But be careful that when you reestablish your life that you don't reestablish it on your attractions for the sin in which you once indulged in. Oh, be careful, beloved of God. You don't know of the kind of disaster you are embracing right now. Flee from it. National sins, what can we do about them? Well, we can certainly know this, that national sins ruin nations. Find a place in the Bible where a nation that does not repent from her sins still exists in the form in which they were in the day in which they refused to repent. Even take the seven churches of the book of Revelation in consideration. What church that is called to repentance and doesn't repent is still in existence today. There is no such thing. God will deal with corporate sins. Whether it be a national sin, whether it be a church sin, whether it be a family sin, 
God will deal with sin. Some of you, individually or corporately, are giving more in promotion of the sin that is opposed to God than you are in the promotion of holiness. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's some kind of a trade-off that you can give so much promotion of sin and so much promotion of holiness. I'm saying to the professor of Christ, you have only one option. And that is to be a promoter of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promoter of all things holy. What business do you have in investing of the blessings that God has given you in sinful activity? You have no business in it. And yet, you will defend it, you will invest in it, and you will give yourself to the defense of it because it is actually from your own heart as well. But then finally, let's bring that beloved Ruth back into the picture. Jesus, the Redeemer of the world, the Savior of sinners. Jesus is given through a wicked nation. God loves the story of redemption. That even here, out of a nation, stated haters of God, that God would redeem one such as Ruth. This is the story of redemption of the greatest kind. That God would take someone, one of His enemies, and He would place her in such a place that when we would hear the name Ruth, we would think, oh, here, out of her comes the Savior. Out of her bloodline, out of her family, out of the grace of God comes our Savior. The Apostle Paul makes mention of it in this way. When he mentions about how great sin is, he speaks of a greater Savior. Where sin abounds, he puts it, grace abounds even more. Where sin abounded in such a place as Moab, grace abounded even more. The nation of Moab no one will ever look at as anything good and holy or righteous of. But when this woman of Moab is mentioned, there's nothing but joy and pleasure in God in what He did. Where, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. What about you today? Does sin abound much in you? Have you set your tent facing all things sinful? Have you set up yourself in such a way that you can always get to that which is opposed to God? Are you living in that filthy wash bucket? You, can, you might be able to, to show everyone how you've cleaned yourself up. And yet if you were to look down and see that you're, sta see that you're still standing in that wash basin filled with the grime of the world, you really have not left anything. You've only, you've only made a, a picture for yourself of what you think you want people to see of you. Or rather today, would you not call upon the name of that Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, who's brought to humanity through one of the stated national enemies of Almighty God, where He redeems her, saves her, and sets her in position that all might see the real Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. You may not have ever seen of yourself as an enemy, a sworn enemy of God. Isn't it just like God that He would take an enemy of His and He would put His grace upon you and then He would send you to the nations to speak of His gospel? Would you not do that today? Would you not repent of the sin that you've so easily allowed to entangle you? That which you're even ignoring, that which you're even 
pretending as though this is certainly about someone else today, would you not, would you not right now seek the face of this gracious God, this compassionate God who says, my heart cries out for you.